Rahim. In this video, I will be refuting Acts 17 apologetics on his new video released about four days ago. Did Jesus pray like a Muslim? We'll refute him by showing his own Bible and showing how inconsistency his arguments are and show the contradictions within the Bible. So let's continue with what he says and we'll pause it and refute his allegations. Sometimes I respond to a Muslim in the comments section of YouTube and then I see other Muslims using the same silly argument so I have to respond over and over again and then I realize that I should just put the response into a video so that anyone who encounters the argument can simply share the response. Well how nice of you David Wood. Upload the videos and you know you're calling them silly arguments but we'll see at the end of this video who's the silly one but it's great. You know, upload your videos and at least that way we can demolish them. In the book of Matthew 2639, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, fell on his face and prayed just like the Muslims do in Mecca and Medina five times every day. I have never seen any Christian falling on his face and praying. This. So basically he pretty much quoted what a Muslim always uses as an argument to show that uh, Prophet Jesus actually prayed like Muslims and now he goes on to apparently give his response to that. So let's go ahead and see what he says. On Facebook and Twitter, as we look at three of them, notice that they never quote the entire verse. Why don't they quote the entire verse? Because if they quoted the rest of the verse, it would destroy their argument. So here's a picture of a Muslim praying and we read at the bottom. And he, Jesus, went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. Rest of the verse omitted. Ma so that's Matthew 26, 39, and he reckons that the rest of the verse is omitted. So let's continue. Matthew 26, 39. Once again, and he, Jesus, went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. Rest of the verse omitted. Matthew 26, 39. Then we have, even Jesus, peace be upon him, bowing to the ground, praying to his God. Odd that Muslims who constantly complain about images of Muhammad are so quick to pass around a picture of Jesus. One more, Jesus prayed like this, Matthew 26, 39, why don't you? This one doesn't quote any of the verse. So this is meant to show that Jesus prayed like a Muslim and that he must have been a Muslim, and that followers of Jesus should therefore convert to Islam. Now for my response. Hi, gold man. You've never seen a Christian praying on his face because Jesus commanded his followers, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, Go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret. Okay, so let's um, refute his point on this. Uh, we'll show you how clear the contradictions are within the Bible when he actually quotes this verse. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Matthew 6, 5-6. Notice that this is the same book you just cited to show that Jesus prayed like Muslims. Muslims pray in the open so that you may be seen by men. Jesus condemns your prayers. Jesus also said, in the same book you cited, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Okay, so we'll get, go to the next verse about the repetitions, but let's show him the double standards and the hypocrisy here. As you know, the Bible is full of contradictions. Now, he claims that the Muslims are hypocrites because they openly uh, pray uh, where Jesus apparently commanded to pray in secret as he claims. So this is according to the book of Matthew. But watch how there are so many contradictions. If we go to the book of Luke, and I'll actually show you the verse, Jesus and his own disciples did not pray in secret. They actually prayed openly. 
So notice we, we already see a contradiction and I'll actually go to the verse here where it actually says it. I'll, I'll quote you the verse, we'll go and you can read it for yourself. So Jesus himself, apparently in the book of Matthew, I mean, this is a contradiction, obviously. Someone's, I mean, both stories can't be true. Jesus can't be going ahead, praying with his disciples openly and not in secret, but then he goes ahead and apparently preaches, do not pray openly in the synagogues, do it in secret uh, in, in your own privacy, in your own room. So let's go now and show him how easily this gets debunked. Before we go to the passage of Luke, let me first quote you Matthew 26, 36 to 46, and we'll go to the context. You know, that's what he said to do. But look how even the disciples of Jesus was with Jesus when he went to pray. He didn't do this in secret. So let's quote from verse 36. It says, and this is at the Garden of Gethsemane where they went to pray. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Notice, he tells him to sit there, and he goes over there to pray. He actually tells them that he's going over there to pray. Notice, he's not doing it in secret. No, no, no. He's telling the disciples to sit here while I go over there to pray. Then he says in verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. So notice here, Jesus doesn't even go by himself. He takes Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to sorrowfully and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And then it says in verse 39, Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not my will, but as you will. And notice, look what verse 40 says. It says, Then he turned to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he says, Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. <laughs> so look at this verse. Jesus is telling the disciples Watch so you do not fall into temptation. So Jesus is instructing the disciples to watch him pray. So according to David Wood, he's saying, oh, it's apparently hypocritical to pray in the open and not pray in secret because he quotes that verse. Yet Jesus himself contradicts that verse by going against it and praying openly. So what the Muslims do today by praying openly is exactly what uh, Jesus is doing. So if there is a contradiction in your text in the book of Matthew, that's Matthew's problem. He's the one making the contradiction about claiming that praying in open is apparently hypocritical when both the Muslims and Jesus are actually praying open in the presence of people. And in fact, Jesus is encouraging people to watch him pray. So how is that... Um, how is that a, a, you know, an error on the Muslim part? And I know what a Christian is going to do. He's going to say, oh, but this is where Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray. No, actually, that was Jesus praying. He was asking the Father. He wasn't making a joke or he wasn't metaphorically asking for the Father for help. He was actually praying and sincerely asking God. So he wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a part of an act where he was just saying, you know, he was pretending to ask the Father to pass the cup. No, it was all part of the worship. And Jesus wanted his disciples there to watch him do all of this. So, you know, if you want to call the Muslims a hypocrite, you're Jesus and his followers a hypocrite. In fact, Jesus told his disciples to come with him to see him pray. In fact, read from verse 43 of the same passage. It says, When he came back and he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, so he lifted them up and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. So notice, so he left them and went away and he, and he prayed again. So he was actually a little bit annoyed that they were sleeping and they weren't watching him 
pray and so forth. So there you go. I mean, your Bible is either full of contradictions or Jesus is contradicting his own word, yet he's being annoyed that people are sleeping and not watching him pray. So where, where is the secrecy here? Now, here's the interesting thing. The actual Garden of Gethsemane uh, is actually an open field, as you can see here. So it's not in the private of your home or in the private of your own bedroom and so forth. You're actually praying out in the open. And as you can see, uh, when we go to Wikipedia, it says, is a garden of foot of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, most famous as the place of Jesus prayed and his disciples slept the night before Jesus' crucifixion. So, again, I mean, where is the secrecy and the privacy here? I, I don't see the secrecy and privacy. It's in an open field. You know, isn't it even more interesting that when you look at the tele, uh, tele evangelist Christians on your TV, you see them openly preaching, openly praying in their churches, glorifying God and praying, but I don't see David Wood condemning them and saying you are all hypocrites and you're all praying openly where Jesus taught to pray secretly. Yet their own uh, prominent Christians and apologists are praying openly uh, in front of the audience. I mean, so wh where is the uh, consistency here? We'll see, we see another such narration in Luke 22, 39 to 46, as I said earlier, and it gets more interesting. Have a look. It says, Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. It says in verse 39, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. Did you notice that? And his disciples followed him. Verse 40, on reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall in temptation. So notice here, the disciples are praying in congregation, just like the Muslims pray openly in congregation. So where is the secrecy here? Then in verse 41, it says, He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. So just a stone length in front of them, Jesus knelt, knelt down and prayed. And he quotes, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. So again, we see the same narration uh, in even more detail, showing that even an angel came down and gave Jesus strength. This is apparently the biblical God. And that's another subject, how God is Jesus and Jesus prays to God. But then apparently Jesus, who is meant to be fully God and fully man, he receives angels to give him power but that's another subject so more contradictions this godly man apparently praying but so as you can see jesus prays with his own disciples and they do it openly and not in secret it's openly in front of everyone so when you have that verse in matthew where jesus apparently says pray in secret apparently that is a clear contradiction to what jesus himself did Either Jesus is a hypocrite and he's not saying what he, uh, he doesn't follow what he says, or according to your Bible, book of Matthew has made a blatant error and a contradiction. In fact, let's go through other passages in the Bible. Look at Genesis 17, 1 through to 4. It says, And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and before thy perfect. And I will make them my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Notice, look what verse 3 says now, listen. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be father of my nations. And then Deuteronomy 5, 6, 9, it says, Bow down myself unto them and serve them and it goes forward look at this in psalms 56 uh, 95 6 it says O come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord and notice it's talking in plurality people going down kneeling and worshiping god look at deuteronomy 9 24 25 it says i fell down before the lord 40 days and 40 nights and then revelation 7 11 through to 12 it says 
And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne of their on their faces and worshipped God. So notice, look, even the angels all together, they bowed their faces and worshipped God together. Notice, even not even the angels are doing the, uh, this in secret. They're doing it openly in the presence of God and worshipping God. Look at Joshua 7, 6 through to 7. It says, And Joshua rent, rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. Notice, even the elders, all the elders together of Israel, along with Joshua, prayed and fell with their faces before their Lord. Read Numbers 16, 20 through to 22. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron. And reading through the verse 22, it says, And they fell upon their faces. So look, Moses and Aaron both together, are they now hypocrites? They're falling with their faces to the ground and praying to God. Why didn't Moses and Aaron go on their separate ways and pray in their own rooms privately? But according to now Matthew, they're hypocrites now for praying together openly. So there you have it, folks. I mean, this is just contradictions upon contradictions upon contradictions. So let's now continue and debunk the rest of his stuff. Matthew 6, 5 to 6. Notice that this is the same book you just cited to show that Jesus prayed like Muslims. Muslims pray in the open so that you may be seen by men. Jesus condemns your prayers. <laughs> and so Jesus condemns Abraham and Aaron and Moses and Joshua and all of these prophets. And he condemns all of his disciples. In fact, he even condemns himself by going openly like we saw in the refutation. Jesus also said, in the same book you cited, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Matthew 6, 7. What do Muslims do when they pray? They recite memorized prayers in a language most of them don't understand. Even more hilarious, the exact verse you cited condemns you. And here's why Muslims never quote the entire verse when they... So let's pause it there. Now, isn't it interesting that Christians actually speak in tongues? Apparently, your Bible says speak in tongues, in repetition and in tongues. And most Christians don't even understand what the hell they're talking about when they're saying in tongues. I mean, no Christian understands another Christian what he's saying. I mean, I've seen it so many times on Pal Talk. You get a Christian to speak in tongues, you get him to repeat what he says. And he can't even translate it. He's just mumbling and yapping on. So according to this verse, your own Christians are in condemnation and in cont contradiction by Jesus. And Muslims don't repeat things meaningless, without any meaning. Surah Al-Fatiha has a, every part of the Quran has a meaning. Right? So this, this isn't just meaningless. Even uh, the, those special three letters... Elif, Bet, Lam, uh, and so forth. Allah even knows their meanings. So they, and that will be revealed on the day of judgment. So this isn't meaningless Quran. The Quran is with meaning, and what we recite in the Quran does come with meaning, right? We know it, and if we don't know it, then Allah knows it. So how is that even meaningless? So we do definitely know the meanings of the Quran and what is supposed to be known to us. And that's basically a clear refutation to your point. He says, most Muslims don't know. I mean, I, I don't speak. I mean, I can't understand exactly Arabic, but anyone could memorize the English. So Surah Al-Fatiha, what I read in my prayer when I'm reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillah Rabbin Alameen, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the world. So I know the meaning of that. Just because I don't know Arabic doesn't mean I can't learn the 
English to translate what the Arabic means. So to me, it's not meaningless to repeat that in my five daily prayers. So you're making silly arguments. You know, isn't it funny that apparently the Trinity is a mystery according to the Christian faith, right? It can't exactly be explained, right? So it's a mystery. Christians will say there are mysteries within the Trinity. So according to your book, that apparently is meaningless since we can't get the full grasp of it. And I know Christians would often say, oh, you need the Holy Spirit to understand the Trinity and its mystery. It can't be fully understood why, for example, the Father will give all judgment to the Son and the Son will judge everyone on the day of judgment and the, and the Father will judge no one according to John 5.22. And Christians will say, oh, well, that's a mystery of the Trinity. And Because when I ask them the question and I say, well, how can... You know, there be one God, yet one God watches while the other God judges. Doesn't make any sense. And Christians will often say, well, that's a mystery of the Trinity. Then therefore, that's meaningless. So according to your book, that's meaningless. So Jesus actually said you are condemned your own book. Okay, so let's continue to refute him. Even more hilarious, the exact verse you cited condemns you. And here's why Muslims never quote the entire verse when they use this argument. Matthew 26, 39 reads, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus calls God my Father. According to the Quran, 930, Jesus is not the Son of God. Okay, so this is a clear conflation error. I mean, he's now comparing the biblical language to the Quranic language. Now notice he's saying that in the Quran, there is no such thing as the father or the son and so forth. But you see, the Christians are looking at the Bible with this literal sense you know when it comes to you know jesus not knowing the hour or jesus being less than the father and so this is all you know metaphorical and so forth it doesn't mean what it means but then when it comes to sonship and fathership they say this is literal but you know throughout the bible we see this biblical language all the time expressed there are many sons and daughters of god in the bible this is only to show how you know Jesus was a servant of God because if you read Acts eight twenty six I believe it was um, or Acts eight thirty two you will see how Jesus uh, the the term son is actually transferred into substituted uh, more correctly into the term servant or slave of God and so forth so this is just a connection of showing that they are godly people. And we even see this in the Bible where, according to the book of John 10, 34 through to 20, 35, it says that Jesus, for example, are called the Jews gods. He said, you are gods. I mean, does anyone take that literal? No, you're going to say that's just metaphorical. They're just godly people. So these terms, father, son, ship and so forth, the Quran actually removed these terms only because Christians took it literal. If Christians didn't take it literal, then yeah, sure, maybe Allah would have said, declared himself as the father or maybe he would have called Jesus his son and so forth. But since the Christians took it literal and took it out of context and made it something that, oh, Jesus is you know God's begotten son is unique and so forth and the father is like a real father to him then you know um, you know since they did that of course the Quran is going to come around and say hey look you know we're going to remove those sentiments and statements and you know because you know obviously Christians are misinterpreting it and taking it as literal literal we don't want that to happen to the Muslims so you know Allah removing that doesn't mean that you know, there's a contradiction and Jesus prayed to his father and not to, you know, Allah and so forth. This is, you know, a nonsensical argument. And, you know, he's saying, well, why don't Muslims pray to God as the father? Well, I've explained why. And that doesn't negate the fact that Jesus didn't pray to God. It shows that he did pray to God. But obviously, he, you know, the Muslims don't use the same sentiments because obviously Christians have polluted that theology and that's why that is removed.
but it doesn't mean that the essence is, is not there. Just like Jesus prayed to God, Muslims do the same. Indeed, the Quran. Let's continue. Jesus calls God my Father. According to the Quran, 930, Jesus is not the Son of God. Indeed, the Quran declares that Allah is a Father to no one. See uh, you know, according to the Bible, um, Paul actually said that he has now become your father. This is according to the New Testament. Now, does this mean a literal father? No. I mean, I mean, excuse me for saying this, but did, did Paul sleep with your great, great, great grandmother? Of course not. This is only supposed to be metaphorical and not literal. So the same term is applied to between Jesus' relationship with the father God in heaven, so it's not his real father, or you know, this is only meant to be a non literal father. So, I mean, that's just a biblical language. No one would consider Apostle Paul to be their father, right? But when you say Paul is your father, this is only metaphorical through the Bible, it doesn't mean it's your real father. So, that is exactly what the Quran emphasizes as well. Uh, we can see that even how Jews understood the term sonship, and we'll go a little bit more into this, it says it was never understood to be literal. The term son of God is used throughout the Old Testament to refer to figures who were beloved and chosen by God. The Jewish encyclopedia for the term son of God in the Greek manuscripts of the Synoptic Gospels bear the terms pais or paida or heos throughout. The translators of the Holy Bible translated in such a way as to force the reader to understand the verse in a certain way. There are no capital letters in the Greek or Hebrew. For example, in Greek, pais means servant, and where hoios son was used, once again, it could be used to denote a uh, filial relationship, whereas the son of gods are identical with the saints. Son of God is a term used in ancient Hebrew for righteous persons. God calls Israel his son. This is what the Lord says. Israel is my older son in Exodus 4.22. Also, David is called the son of God. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten thee. Psalms 2.7. In fact, anyone who is righteous is referred to as God's son. All who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. This is in Romans 8.14. Jesus uh, you know, according to 1 John 4.15, apparently Jesus is the Son of God. You know, Christians are saying this is uh, literal. But then in Psalms 82.6, uh, all Jews are sons of God. But then Christians play around and say this is only figurative and so forth. So again, you see how when Christians want to exaggerate, Islam comes in and removes these titles, sons and fathers, because we see that there's an exaggeration made by the Christians. And of course, we've seen how in the RSV version, how the word begotten has been removed from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, where apparently... You can read John 3.16 for that. Compare the King James Version... Uh, the NIV and then look at the RSC version and see how the word begotten has been removed because uh, it's not there in the earliest manuscripts and you can actually see how Christians were exaggerating and trying to put forward that Jesus was the son of God by lying that it was literal and this is why uh, the Bible itself has removed such exaggeration and Allah actually clarifies it to say don't use these uh, words anymore because Christians are exaggerating and so we can remove any confusion Let's just keep it as, you know, I'm not the father and Jesus is not my son. Not in those terms anyway, because Christians are exaggerating. And so therefore we're going to remove those terms. Let's continue. So if we believe the verse you cited, Islam is false. Beyond this, Jesus prayed in different positions. John 17, 1 states, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Jesus prayed while looking up to heaven. I've never seen a Muslim pray like this. Notice also, once... Uh, so there you have it. That is his um, last response. Uh, and uh, apparently, according to this verse, Jesus prayed with his eyes 
to heaven and so forth. And you can actually see in the comment section where uh, another non-Muslim wrote, he cited in the comment section of a hadith where the Prophet uh, requested to cast down anyone who actually looks up into the heaven. So the Prophet Muhammad said, do not look uh, into the heaven with your eyes open uh, and so forth. So then he's actually trying to say, oh, look, you know, there you have Islam teach us something different. But you see that there is a error on his part. We know that Jesus, unlike the rest of the Muslims, he was a prophet of God, right? So there was an exception made here that Jesus was allowed to look up, right? While the rest of the Ummah or the rest of the Muslims or the rest of the Christian followers were not supposed to look up. Only Jesus um, looked up to heaven and so forth with his eyes because he was a prophet of God. So, you know, that's an exceptional case. And we know that prophets are prophets and they're not, exactly um, like the rest of us they're chosen by God they've given that special status so I could just argue back and say that was an exception because they were prophets and that's why they were allowed to look up unlike the rest of the Muslims so there you have it that's a clear refutation to David Wood smack bang